Chuck Bahaf, Din Sien, the CI, Stomach CI, Kui and Sna. I wish to first acknowledge the traditional ter territory of the Tawasan First Nation and thank them for allowing us to gather on their ancestral lands. Uh, my name is Ian Tate, and I'm the Executive Director of the Delta Chamber of Commerce, and I'd like to welcome you, number one, to the newly refurbished dining room and ballroom at the Coast Tawasan Inn, but most importantly, to the largest registration of uh, any event that the Delta Chamber has had in its 105-year history. So thank you for being part of that. Uh, thank you, everybody, for taking some time out of your day to uh, join us here. So it... Uh, Opportunity for us to talk about. Uh, let's say, I hope we don't have a presentation. I'm not aware that we do. So, so maybe it's a nice picture. Oh, look at that, Tilbury. We're here to talk a little bit about our uh, Tilbury, uh, our Tilbury uh, LNG facility expansion, and uh, uh, as well talk a bit about some of the uh, great work that our partner Bechtel has been doing uh, with respect to that particular project in terms of managing it for us, and uh, we'll hear about some plans that Westpac Midstream. Uh, as far as as we continue to as we continue to build that particular facility out, so uh, I was going to thank Mayor Lois Jackson for uh, joining us today. I guess she's on her way, and so we'll have an opportunity to uh, thank her a little later. As many of you are likely aware, we had a bit of a celebration last Monday at our Tilbury facility, uh, really marking the uh, marking the uh, one year celebration of of our groundbreaking. Groundbreaking, and uh, Mayor Jackson was kind enough to join us for that particular uh, event. I uh, certainly like to thank Mayor Jackson and our staff, the Corporation of Delta, for the uh, excellent work and the help that they've uh, provided to us in terms of facilitating this project. They have been a great group of individuals to work with. Also, like to recognize and thank Vicki Hunting for taking the time out of her schedule to join us here today. Some of you have likely already heard last Monday that the Tawasa First Nation is now consulting with its members on a concept uh, to develop an LNG export facility on Tawasan lands. This concept was put forward as a joint venture uh, that includes one of our subsidiaries, Ford's LNG Development Inc. It also includes Nextera and Mitsui. And, uh, as this particular concept proceeds, the nation will uh, certainly be involved in all aspects of the development work uh, as we work with the regulatory and permitting agencies to ensure that this facility addresses highest environmental and, uh, and safety standards. And, uh, but first, uh, the Tawasa First Nation needs to go through an appropriate process and determine whether or not this is a project that, uh, that they as a First Nations are open to. And uh, we'll look forward to a member vote which will be conducted in, uh, in mid-December. Today, that said, today I'm going to focus on our Tilbury LNG facility, and uh, which is just down the road. Uh, just by way of reference, Ford is BC is a, a natural gas distribution utility. We own and operate a small electrical utility in the south central interior of British Columbia. We serve about 1.1 million customers, and we operate in approximately 135 communities and 56 First Nation communities in British Columbia. Our natural gas liquefaction plant in Tilbury Island is a key asset that we've used to serve customers for years. It's been in operation since 1971. We have over 45 years of experience with LNG. There really is nothing new or groundbreaking about LNG. Simply, it's natural gas that's been converted to a liquid for ease of transportation and storage. It's not flammable, it can't burn because it contains no oxygen or air to react with, with fuel. In the past, our Fortis BC facility on Tilbury was used solely for storage. We'd vaporize, we'd vaporize the liquefied natural gas, piping it into our system to meet supply on the cold days when we need to serve our customers. Now we're finding other opportunities. Tilbury also fuels truck, trucking and mining vehicles, and we're starting to move into the marine vessels, such as those Fortis BC Varies and C-SPAN that are commissioning, that are in the current, in currently being commissioned. That helps power towns. It also helps power towns in Yukon and the Northwest Territories, switching them from higher emitting fuels. We see the purpose of LNG continuing to evolve over a period of time. Ian, I'm having a fight with the microphone and I'm losing. <laughs> we continue to see the purpose of LNG evolving over a period of time, which is one of the reasons why we're expanding Tilbury. As mentioned earlier, many of you heard in the media, we're now one year into our $400 million expansion of the Tilbury facility, and it is fueling a growing demand on this particular resource. 
one of the reasons why we celebrated the uh, the one year anniversary uh, a couple of the last week was that uh, just two to three weeks ago we actually raised the roof on our new 1.1 billion cubic feet uh, storage tank in the, in the facility. We've seen some great benefits to the community coming out of this project, including $50 million in local contracts, of which approximately $10 million have gone to companies right here in Delta. Approximately 90% of the full-time staff that are working on the project live locally. This means they're delivering benefits and services to retail industries and other businesses that are established here in Delta also. Local companies in this particular project are key to us. Some of those based in Delta include Composite Incorporated, which has grown over the last 33 years from a local fabrication to a Canadian leader in the design, engineering, manufacturing, and supply of fiberglass reinforced plastics. It has 25 staff working at the Tilbury facility. Another Delta-based company working on the project is Ideal Welders, a privately held pressure vessel and power piping fabrication business with over 40 years of experience. They have approximately 30 employees working on the site. And of course, the sponsor of today's event, Sonic Enclosures, has been providing mechanical houses and other products to the project. Sonic, Sonic began in Delta over 40 years ago and uh, by building sound, sound reducing enclosures for sawmill industry. We have another 25, approximately 25 companies in the Delta whose products and services have been purchased by Fortis BC and Bechtel and its contracts support the LNG expansion project. We're also proud of the way that we've managed to collaborate with First Nations. For example, a partnership with the Tawasan First Nations, construction of local contractor Matt Connor providing essential civil engineering site service to the project. The joint venture called TMJV is 51% owned by the Tawasan First Nation and will provide a number of training opportunities for First Nations. Most recently, we actually provided some rapid provided the Aboriginal Skills Group with a $75,000 grant to prepare First Nations people with an apprenticeship program for trades that will be in demand and growth as the, as the liquefied natural gas industry continues to develop. We are interested in creating jobs that provide opportunities for British Columbians, for our businesses and workers, that also support schools and the municipal services so that our neighborhoods flourish. In closing, we'll take the opportunity to thank everyone for once again taking the time to join us and we certainly do welcome the opportunity to be a part of the communities that we serve. I'd like to really start off by, by celebrating a recent major milestone. And uh, it was, it was a little, attributed a little bit uh, earlier, but it's the LNG tank roof raise. And uh, while generally simple in its execution, it's really just blowing air into the bottom of the tube to raise the roof. It's unbelievably complex and, and very risky in terms of the actual execution. But also, in the event that any of a myriad of things happen, it's near catastrophic to the schedule of the project. So that happened about a month ago. It's, it's an unbelievably boring evolution when you're there. It takes about uh, six hours or so. It starts in the, the dark in the morning, and it, and it takes a long time to get up. But there's a lot of people that are involved. So uh, thanks again. And it's, it's one of the cr critical aspects of a, a tank project that is, is really the highlight. So I appreciate it. Now, a little bit about me. I know Ian uh, was waxing poetic and, and making some me look a little bit better than I really was as captain of a submarine and other things, but I've been with Bechtel now for about five years, and I had a career in the construction industry before that, and then the military before that, um, but I've been with Bechtel now just over five years, and if you're not familiar with the company, we're an international EPC contractor. Uh, we've been in existence now for over 117 years. Um, we've been in Canada for 70, and most of you if you hadn't been involved in the project, probably have never heard of us. And uh, I'll be honest, we kind of like it that way. Uh, it's a private company, and uh, we, we like to stay out of the papers as much as possible, save videos like this where there's major milestones. But we do, we do a lot of that in the background. Uh, we've been in the LNG construction business for over 50 years. And currently today, we are responsible for over 40% of the liquefaction capacity currently under construction worldwide. So 
Um, and that's major LNG projects. It's small midstream. It's, it's projects like this. Um, so, so we do have some background in the procurement aspect. I know Ian wanted me to talk a little bit about that. Is we buy a lot of stuff. And, uh, and that's putting it mildly. And, and I'll be honest with you that, as some of you can attest uh, on this project and others in the, in the past, that we aren't the easiest company to work with, especially at the beginning. Um, we're very daunting. Our requirements are daunting, uh, especially for companies that aren't used to working with a large EPC contractor. But I can tell you that if you, if you work with us, and, and we, uh, we make every effort to do this, and your experience may vary, but we really try, and we realize that there's a collaboration, it's a partnership between company and vendor or contractor, and, and we only succeed if you do, and we want you to participate. And, uh, and we make every effort to really, if you're not there yet, to work with you and work with training and get you over that hurdle so that you do qualify, so that you can actually, as a company, bid on projects and get awarded, and subsequently, for future endeavors worldwide, be part of that. So again, I'm just going to state the obvious is I know. I know that we're not easy, but it's worth it. Um, now, I was going to go through the current stats, but you've, you've heard them about five minutes ago. And uh, we'll actually go, the, this is actually from Fortis's graphic. It's hard to read, but it's, uh, it's something that Mike said earlier. Um, and this, this number is actually today probably about 60 million locally. Um, so 10, 100, over 100, I think that number is now about 125 or so local companies. And, uh, and really it's the, the 10, 10 local communities. And that's really what we're, the lower mainland is what we were counting when this, these numbers here. But I'll be honest with you. The numbers aren't the important aspect. It's the fact that the companies and you all are, and those of those of companies in the local in endeavors, are really participating in this with Bechtel for future growth. It's not that it's 50 million. It's not that it's 60 million dollars invested today. It's the fact that a dollar today positions you, if you prepare well, to work tomorrow to work tomorrow in the Lower Mainland, to work tomorrow in BC, tomorrow in Canada, tomorrow worldwide, if you want to. So it positions you for the opportunity for future growth. And it's the sustainability that's the important aspect from our point of view. The numbers are what grab headlines. It's the opportunities and the intangibles that I think that it's really important to grasp. Now, our philosophy at Bechtel now that I've said globally, is, is really on the execution on the procurement side is to look locally first. It's not what everybody thinks of. They think large global company is going to source large and globally. Actually, success shows that it's when we look locally first that we have the best performance. It's companies like yourselves who are right down the road to take ownership, to take the the, the tie-in with the local communities, the know the workforce, the, the, the ability to drive five minutes down the road to the site, or an hour, depending on where you are, is critical. And it's critical not just for us, but also for yourselves. It's in your backyard. And, and that's important for us. Our, our performance is directly linked, intricately linked, to the success of the local for workforce, the local vendors, and the local community. We use a self-perform model. We try to. It's what we're based on. It's a four-letter word in some circles. I'm here to tell you that what it does is it gives us the flexibility to tailor our procurement to suit you. And, and there are stories, and I see you sitting around the room, that you don't have to take it from me. These examples are sitting among you. And what we can do is we can allow maximum participation locally without overextending you. And there's a significant risk when a company or a project like this comes to a local community where the, the initial reaction is to try to bite off more than you can chew. And it can be unbelievably damaging if, 
if it is just slightly more than you can handle, catastrophic to yourselves, not just to your company, but also to the project and the owner. So those are things that, just to keep in mind, that it allows Bechtel the flexibility to act quickly, and I know that it's kind of a funny thing to think, is Bechtel can act quickly, but that model allows that to happen on a procurement time scale. Now, early engagement to us is also paramount. A year and a couple months ago, I sat uh, with Ian, actually doing a similar presentation on the Fortis Tilbury project when we were first starting. Arena, you were there, and, and others. And, um, and while not as early as we would have liked, it was almost as early as we could have based on the timing of the, the project. And it was critical to get the local vendors and yourselves involved in our procurement process. It takes a long time to get involved. And it takes a long time to get through it. But once you're pre-qualified, then it, then it actually works pretty well. It's an oiled machine once you're in it. It's just difficult to get on board the train. Um, the performance of the project, and I know I said it before, it's, it's really the entire chain. And uh, part of my background, there's a, there's a law of the Navy. And it, it's a long poem, but the first line basically is, upon the strength of one link in the cable, dependent the might of the chain. So, and that's really the weakest link in the chain. And that's really evident when it comes to a supply chain. Unbelievably evident. It's, you know, Fortis's success is dependent on everyone. It's on us. And, and the, basically it's, to the EPC contractors, to the owners, to the vendors, to your suppliers, to your workforce, everything is linked. And uh, in the local communities, when you know that it's in your backyard and you can't walk away from it if it fails, we like that. And we think that that's a better success model than it is if we sourced it from around the world. There's no ownership in that model, and no success. Now, conversely, the failure of one link, again, causes the whole chain to fail. And as such, the, the early awareness that I was just speaking about and the knowledge of opportunities in the future, because it's not just what's happening today or what's happening tomorrow, but how do you position your company for something that's gonna happen three months from now or two years from now? That's really the important thing that everybody should be thinking about is not the opportunity today or tomorrow but to be ready when that puck does drop, if and when it drops. Unfortunately, I can't sit here and, and talk to you about all the opportunities that are uh, on my desk or on others' desks in the company. I can't. I would love to, but I'm not allowed. And those sitting around the table would be upset if I started uh, uh, prognosticating about opportunities that may or may not come in times where they may or may not happen. So, point is, is that uh, get in, get pre-qualified, get ready, and prepare yourself when the opportunity does come. And be pragmatic about it, is know what you can handle and go after it. Don't be afraid that, the, that a company such as Bechtel might say that you're too small, because that's not the case. We really, we would rather give it to 10 companies that can handle it than one that can't, and, and split it up that way. Now, uh, again, like I said, many of you sitting in attendance can attest. So I'm really not going to wax it anymore on the, uh, the benefits and the, and the necessity of getting in with Bechtel and getting with the, the procurement system and getting pre-qualified. You can look around the tables, and there are those of you out there who have been through this and can tell you exactly uh, the benefits of it, and probably, conversely, some of the challenges that you've seen that I may or may not know. So with that, um, you know, going back through, here are some of the industries that we currently have. And it's a graphic that you've seen before, or at least that Fortis has put up. And I, I stole it. But uh, almost, every, I don't know if you can even see it. But it's, I'm just going to read it across. Welding, pipe fitting, security, safety, structural steel, uh, fabrication, insulation, wire, power solutions, um, you know, Brian was down there supplying things for us, uh, scaffolding, catering, every aspect of the project basically is being supplied here. Now there's some specialty items that 
only come from one place in the world. Sorry, that's only going to, certain steel is only going to come from one foundry in Italy. That's the way it is, just the way it happens. But for everything else, we look here first, and you're seeing it evident on the Tilbury project. And uh, with that, that's really it. So uh, thank you very much for your uh, participation on the Tilbury project. Thank you very much for your participation in this luncheon. I look forward to uh, meeting each and every one of you and catching up. So uh, please let me know. Thank you very much. Uh, so the previous two uh, Michaels have talked about what has been going on and is going on today in LNG and so I would like to introduce to you a proposed project for kind of the next phase and that would be putting LNG onto marine vessels so that the uh, LNG can go for either local use or export and this will enable uh, Fortis to make more LNG and, and uh, all lead to more jobs for other industries uh, aspects of it that are related on shore. So uh, we're calling our project the Westpac Tilbury Marine Jetty because it's on Tilbury Island. Uh, so this is an aerial view here. Um, it's a little hard without a pointer here because I've got the three screens, but in the kind of lower left uh, you can see the existing Fortis plant, the yellow tank there and the C-SPAN uh, ferry docks out in front. So our dock would be uh, just in the water in front of that. This is a view uh, looking to the west of the Fraser River. Let's see how we work this here. Oh, how about that? <clears throat> so, first of all, I'd just like you to understand who uh, Westpac is. We were founded in 1998. Uh, we're a midstream energy development company. That means midway between production of oil and gas and the end consumer of those products. So, we develop, own, and operate. Uh, facilities, infrastructure facilities like that. Uh, we've worked with tank farms, pipelines, marine terminals, airport fuel facilities uh, all over North America. <clears throat> We're owned by High Star Capital, which is a seven billion dollar private equity fund that invests in, in, in midstream infrastructure, in turn owned by Oak Tree Capital, a 90 billion dollar fund. So I just say that so that you know that we have the, the financial capital to uh, execute this type of project. So what our proposed project is uh, to construct a single berth jetty and dock to accommodate one ship or barge at a time. And they would be then loaded with LNG that's produced at the Fortis Tilbury liquefaction plant. Uh, it's in Delta on Tilbury Island adjacent to the Fortis plant. Uh, our schedule is in, in uh, April of 2015. We began this year, we began the environmental assessment process with applications to both federal and provincial environmental offices. Uh, we're hoping by the third quarter of next year to complete approvals of the environmental assessment and the fourth quarter would be of next year the earliest we could start construction for a starting operation then in the second quarter of 2018. <clears throat> so the markets we're pursuing are small and mid-range markets and may smaller than these projects that are in uh, northern BC, for instance. So the barges would be for lower mainland and regional LNG distribution, and also as industrial fuel or fuel for ships, which is called bunkering, even though it's LNG and not bunker fuel. Uh, we have an agreement with Fortis to have the exclusive right to develop, construct, and own and operate the jetty and would be the only ones exporting by ship, other than the fact that they could put LNG onto ISO containers or trucks and, and export it that way if they chose to. But our project is separate and distinct from Fortis, and uh, we're on our own on this. However, we certainly need the LNG and their cooperation uh, to get the, the LNG that we'd be exporting. Um, and our project, we're not buying and selling the LNG. What we're doing is providing the jetty services, the berthing and the loading under long-term tolling agreements. <clears throat> so here's an artist's rendering of what the facility would look like. You can see the yellow tank in the back and the white one further in the back. Um, granted, this is an artist's rendering. But um, you can hopefully see from here uh, the yellow line coming from the white tank is a pipeline 
that would bring LNG from the tank. It would go out on a pile supported jetty structure and then we would use metal loading arms to connect to the ships and uh, put the LNG on there. There would also be a vapor return line so it's completely vapor tight. There would be no vapors going to the atmosphere. The liquid goes in and the, the vapor that's in the ships that's displaced goes back to the Fortis plant for reliquifaction. So this is a layout of the facility, um, again kind of in the um, upper right side you can see the existing tank, it's kind of whitish, and the yellow tank in kind of the middle right, and showing the routing of the pipeline going out to the jetty, and there's an access road uh, that's along the, the bottom of the red and the red there. So for environmental features, uh, the site is an existing uh, prior marine terminal, it was a warehouser, wood chip operation, so they were dragging the logs across the shoreline and there's damage to the shoreline, there's remaining piles there, and so uh, we would be cleaning that stuff up and, and uh, restoring the shoreline to its original condition. Uh, we're using a pile supported structure for the trestle, so there'll be very little impact on the ground and water below. Um, so uh, we're just going to be leaving the area a lot better than it is today. Uh, on the lower right is a barge that uh, Westpac is building. Um, it could be used here and then we also have an LNG project in Jacksonville, Florida where it might be used. So I would want to point out that the LNG bunkering where we're using LNG as, as fuels for the ferries are already doing that and we're looking for other uh, companies to be doing the same thing would be improving local air quality through the use of LNG compared to other uh, fuel oil or diesel. <clears throat> so I just wanted to quickly go over the major permits. From a federal perspective, we filed with the Canadian Environmental Assessment Agency. They said they did a substitution which allows for the BC EAO to prepare the document that covers both provincial and federal requirements. We would need a Navigation Protection Act permit from Transport Canada. We already have an export license from the National Energy Board. Uh, and then moving down in the provincial area where the uh, BCEAO is conducting an environmental assessment for the project, uh, we are right now uh, having out for public comment that it's called the Value Component Selection Document which is an important part of the environmental assessment process. What that means is what are the categories of environmental uh, areas that will be evaluated in the environmental assessment. So things like air, water quality, socioeconomics, fish impacts. And uh, we, it's, it's available on the ECAO website and there are going to be open houses uh, on the next Wednesday and Thursday, one at the Delta Town and Country Inn, and another one in Richmond over at the Holiday Inn in, in Steveston. So you're welcome to go to those. They're from 3 to 8 p.m. There's uh, information I think over there uh, on dates and times uh, and also on the BCAO website. Um, so you can look at the document on the website or you can come to this uh, and or come to this public meeting where there'll be more information and representatives from our consultants and ourselves to uh, answer any questions you might have. Uh, we also need uh, BC Oil and Gas Commission approval for the design aspects and the Ministry of Forest Lands Natural Resource Operations would be granting the water lot and uh, we're working with the Corporation of Delta on a rezoning uh, the area. Consultation wise, uh, we've been out there at meetings such as this, uh, introducing the project project to elected officials and community groups. Uh, we've had some uh, public, well the public workshops that I just mentioned are also part of that uh, and uh, we are trying to talk about local benefits. Um, we're quite a ways away from vendor selection and so uh, I would say that Westpac uh, admires the procurement procedures that Fortis and Bechtel are using 
and I would expect us to find follow something uh, similar. On the First Nations front, uh, we have initially contacted 19 First Nations. We're doing uh, ongoing consultation with them through the environmental assessment process, and 11 of those nations are uh, on Schedule B, which means they uh, warrant the full consultation process. The main concerns seem to be the fisheries and economic opportunities. A little about, about the ship uh, and barge size and frequency. Uh, the picture on the left is uh, an example of one of the types of ships that might uh, be used at this terminal. On the right side, we've got a comparison of other ships, that, vessels that go on the Fraser River. The top one is the uh, container ship that's the largest ship that's currently on the Fraser River. Uh, the one right below it would be the size of an LNG carrier that we might use at the dock. And then uh, there's a ferry there for comparison, and the bottom would be a, a barge, so give you a feeling for that. Uh, as far as ship frequency, uh, during the first couple of years, we probably have about three vessel calls per month. Uh, the maximum, if everything was fully built out, would be about one ship every three days. And we would have a barge about uh, one every 10 days. And at the maximum capacity, that's less than 7% increase in the Fraser River ship movements. I'm sure everyone's concerned about LNG shipping safety, so I just put a few statistics up here. It, <clears throat> the LNG carriers have had an exceptional safety record. There has never been a major accident or security problem in over 50 years of shipping, 135,000 LNG voyages, and 130 million miles traveled. The ships are, that carry LNG are specially built because of the cryogenic nature of LNG. Uh, they have double hull design, they're purpose built specially for this, and they have specially trained crews. We would be working with some special safety measures, the two I think are most important. We would always be using two experienced Fraser River pilots. Uh, on every voyage in the Fraser River, and we would also have two tethered tugs. So that means a tug is already connected fore and aft, front and back, to every one of the ships going up and down the Fraser River. You do that in case there's a rudder failure or engine failure, and they're already connected, and it really makes it impossible for it to collide with the shore. In summary, we think it's a well-conceived project. It's located in an existing industrial site, in an existing industrial area. It's supported by the BC government and Canadian provincial clean energy goals. LNG is safe, clean, proven technology at all stages of transportation, storage, liquefaction, and shipping. We think it brings community benefits of new jobs and property tax revenues, numerous opportunities for local businesses. Uh, I might say that Chris Bland with Osenko Canada is our project manager, so I'm gonna be looking to him for uh, procurement advice. And uh, we're cleaning up the decrepit structures and restoring the shoreline, and uh, the local LNG bunkering will be a benefit locally for air pollution, and LNG contributes, the use of LNG contributes to global greenhouse gas reductions. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Gee, what a beautiful day out there. Now I know why I'm in British Columbia, not in Northern Ontario. And good afternoon, and thank you uh, for adjusting uh, the agenda, Ian, so that uh, I could be here this afternoon. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I was uh, at a Translate meeting this morning. You know, I get so tired of them all being in camera. I wish I could tell you everything, and I did give the chairman notice today. Uh, the chairman is, is uh, Mayor Robinson from, uh, from Vancouver City, and I said, if I decide to take all these agendas and publish them all, the one thing I promise you is, I will tell you first before I do it. It's <laughs> the only thing I'll promise. Last week, ladies and gentlemen, I attended the Fortis BC one year anniversary event for the Tilbury LNG facility expansion. And while I listened to Mr. Mulcahy speak about the project, it got me thinking about just how much the Tilbury industrial area 
has transformed over the last 42 years. It was in November 1973 that the provincial government purchased 726 acres of land along the Fraser River for $4.3 million. Imagine that. 700 acres. Uh, and of course, this was to develop the Tilbury Industrial Park. And a year later, Delta Council approved two zones for the area. Uh, the I-1 zone, which is light industrial, and of course the I-2, which is heavy industrial. And in 1977, I took part, I did it, I, I took part in the Tilbury Industrial Park groundbreaking ceremony as an older woman alongside the Economic Development Minister, Don Phillips. I don't know if any of you remember him. Uh, Delta Mayor's uh, Tom Good, uh, Alderman Tony Schmand, uh, the Delta Chamber of Commerce, John Friesen. You might remember John. Oh, he's not up there, but he is there. There he is. And, uh, no, he's the one on the right, the second from the right. Tony, Tony Schmand's on the right. John Friesen, myself. Now, the person behind <laughs> the dirt that's being thrown, I think, is Bill Reed. And, of course, the minister, and then, of course, Tom Good. From this point on, Tilbury grew into a modern and high-growth industrial park and we have, that we have here today. And few can um, appreciate this change um, as much as for SBC. Their LNG storage facility was actually established in 1971, six years before the industrial park groundbreaking occurred. When Fortis BC approached Delta with a development proposal to undertake a $400 million facility expansion of the Tilbury LNG facility, one of my first thoughts was that this investment had the potential to provide quality employment for many skilled trades and technical people living and working right here in Delta. There are now, and I'm, I, I'm assuming that you've heard this before, but I do want to emphasize that there are now more than 450 tradespeople registered, registered to work on the expansion project, and 90% of the full-time staff live within the Lower Mainland, which means that the benefits of this project will continue to cascade through to the service and retail industries across our community. As Mr. Mulcahy said, uh, local companies really are the key to this project's success. They are, and you've heard a few of them earlier, the wire and cable distributors, the shops that fabricate and install the structural steel, the welders, the crane operators, and it is incredible to hear that more than $50 million in local contracts have been awarded. 10 million of those dollars in Delta alone, and that Three Delta fabricators with a combined 80 employees are working directly on the expansion project. I believe that trades careers are so important to our provincial and our local economy. But more vital is their impact on the lives of the people and the families and the children in our community. We want to see the trades industry continue to thrive in Delta. To that end, we are encouraging today's youth to pursue future careers in the trades. And we do this, ladies and gentlemen, at our annual Trades and Technical Career um, Fair, which we have had, I guess, for three years now. This coming year's event will be held on April the 28th, and I invite you all to join us if you can. Fortis BC has been a major partner in this event since its inception, and they too recognize the importance of promoting careers in the trades to young people, which in turn will lead to a strong, skilled workforce who will be well equipped to tackle projects like the Tilbury LNG expansion in the future. I do want to acknowledge the hard work of the many people involved in this project and the Tilbury LNG expansion has brought 
major economic benefits to our community and we are thankful to Fortis BC and its contractors for choosing local companies to support this project. I think it's also important to mention that this project could not have been possible without the prime industrial land that is available here in Delta. Its value, the value of our industrial land cannot be understated. Tilbury, Anasis Island, Sunbury, all are industrial areas here in Delta that stimulate the economy by increasing employment. They also enhance our tax base, which affords us the ability to tackle large infrastructure projects across Delta. The shortage, the, I'm sorry, the storage of industrial land and the shortage of industrial land across the Lower Mainland continues to drive up the value of our industrial lands here in Delta. And to give you some perspective, in 1976, the assessed value of the Tilbury LNG site was one and a half million dollars. That was 1976, $1.5 million for the LNG site. This year, the site is assessed at $29.4 million. You can see what's happening to land in the Lower Mainland, especially for industrial. We have gone to great lengths to protect the industrial land in Tilbury by encouraging its development through the consolidation and the un, of the underutilized narrow lots and by promoting the environmental cleanup of the old landfill sites all along River Road. In 2005, I've launched the Save Our Industrial Lands initiative to provide economic incentives for the closure of these contaminated brownfield sites to facilitate their redevelopment and spur the economic revitalization of the surrounding areas. And we did, ladies and gentlemen, offer tax exemptions to several brownfield developers since our landmark agreement with Ocean Trailers for the Delta Shake and Shingle landfill redevelopment in 2011. The face of Tilbury is changing, and I am very proud to be a part of this process. Finally, I would be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, Delta is hosting a public open house next Thursday, December the 3rd, and we want to showcase a number of infrastructure projects planned for the South Delta area. The open house is from 4830, it's at the Harris Barn, and I would like you all to attend if you can. Uh, we'll have senior staff there on hand to walk uh, through some of the um, plans with uh, people from the South Delta area. And we'll be discussing Delta Street revitalization, Arthur Drive road improvements, the Ladner waterfront redevelopment, Windscale master plan, to name a few. And I really look forward to you um, possibly being there. Ladies and gentlemen, um, I am remiss. I should have uh, said hello to our new MP. Thank you very much, Carla Qualtor, for being here. Also, uh, Councillor Robert Campbell, thank you, Robert, for being here. Our acting CAO, Stephen Lan. Our Director of Planning and Development, uh, Jeff Day. And I'm not sure if I've missed any others from our Paul. Oh, I see Vicki Huntington is here, our um, MLA from Del South. And who else have I missed? Ian Page. Where is Ian? Down in the corner. <laughs> Where he should be in the corner. He's in the corner. Yeah, I, I can't believe you're here. You're so quiet. I mean, what is that all about, Ian? But ladies and gentlemen, um, you know, I do have to just mention uh, our, my thanks to Westpac and many others, but um, Westpac, of course, uh, are moving ahead with the process, and I must say it is a rigorous, rigorous process. And even if they get through all those steps, guess what has to happen? They have to come to a public hearing in Delta. <laughs> when that happens, if you're in favor, come and help this gentleman. If you're not, that's fine, but I just let you know that this is a long process and uh, it, it is quite rigorous. And also, of course, the TFN has been mentioned, as most of you know, and I'm not sure, is there anyone here from TFN? Oh yes, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, I won't uh, discuss it at all because, as you know, this um, item has to go before the members of the TFN 
um, uh, members and has to be approved prior to anything else happening. And um, ladies and gentlemen, I um, really want to thank those that are involved in this project. And uh, it is um, very interesting to see how far we have actually come in all these years. And I'm sure we have a long way to go as well. Thank you very much for having me today. So we have a number of questions. And uh, if there's any more, again, staff will be going through the room. So we heard from the mayor about the event that's taking place in uh, North Delta uh, next April. And we also heard from one of the presenters uh, regarding a uh, apprenticeship program for First Nation students. And I'm just wondering if uh, somebody could answer the question, uh, what are the trades that are going to be looking looking for? What type of experience are you looking there? And also, uh, who is the contact? The, uh, the type of trades that we look for in terms of LNG operations are process operators, electricians, uh, uh, machinists, uh, mechanical, uh, mechanical background, uh, controls type of uh, controls, uh, system controls, uh, communication control technicians. So, that's sort of a variety of the uh, of the different skill sets that we look. The the LNG facilities aren't generally operated by a single type of skill set. A, a variety of skill sets all required to uh, work the uh, work the various uh, elements on it. Um, with respect to the uh, with respect to the relationship on the uh, funding of the Aboriginal uh, uh, the First Nations uh, training. I, I I think you'd probably be best to speak to somebody from that particular organization as uh, we were a funding agent, not, not the, uh, not the uh, coordinator. So. Gotcha. Good. Thank you. All right. If approved, Westpac LNG would be immediately across the river from a jet fuel facility. Now, I don't know where I'd rather live, close to a jet fuel facility or close to LNG. But the question is, what, uh, what are the safety requirements and how safe is it to have those two uh, venues within close proximity of one another? Well, it could take some time to explain all of the issues, but I'm just saying at this uh, stage, safety uh, and the other facilities will be evaluated in the environmental assessment. We're early in that process in, in establishing it. But you have a uh, crew of Fraser River pilots that have an outstanding safety record. There's never been a major incident on the river. Uh, the added safety precautions that we're taking and will also be taken with the jet fuel ships uh, and the scheduling, it's not like these things just randomly show up. Uh, every precaution will be taken, so there's really no, uh, nothing to work with. Well, you certainly should be concerned, and we will be addressing all of those things to make sure it's absolutely safe. Uh, I know on the phase one reservoir, the original one, there is a containment barrier in and around it. Um, it doesn't seem to be a requirement in phase two to have a spill or leak containment barrier. Uh, have there been any reductions in standards in terms of construction? Well, I can't really speak, and I, and I think that Mike can definitely speak to the containment barrier around the original tank. I can tell you that the, the cryo tank that we have uh, currently on phase 1A um, does not require one. The, uh, there's no processing within that. Sorry, can you hear me? No, um, oh, folks. Really, the, the short answer is it doesn't require it. The, uh, the tank is designed as uh, a double wall cryo tank, and uh, the processing and any leak, uh, the, the outside shell of the tank that you see is not the containment barrier. The, uh, and, it, and it's really contained within it. Um, as far as, yeah, it's a self-contained system. So the, the first, uh, the wall around the original tank, uh, I would um, like to address, but uh, that, that doesn't apply to this one. It, it's simply an advancement in technology where the old tank had an external barrier, the new tank has, has a self-contained, uh, self-containment, so it's simply an advancement in technology. Super. Um, what kind or amount of insurance coverage uh, is uh, there in place for the event of any uh, uh, event taking place where product might go into the Fraser River? Uh, I can tell you as a corporation we have a, we have a significant insurance, uh, insurance coverage. I'm not going to discuss limits and values, but uh, as a corporation with $8 billion in assets here in BC, we do have significant insurance coverage. It covers from a variety of different incidents. 
So how many permanent FTRs will there be in place there? In, in terms of additional uh, employees uh, associated with this current expansion, which is about uh, a quarter of a million uh, metric tons and the 1.1 BCF tank, there will likely be somewhere between 10 and 12, 10 and 13. So it'll be roughly, I think roughly a double the complement. The current regulations in Japan require LNG tanks to be sunken into the ground for greater safety. Uh, I know that those uh, standards don't necessarily extend to North America, but is there anything out there uh, in Canada that looks at uh, burying tanks or requires tanks to be sunk into the ground? I can tell you that the construction of our tank was presented and approved by the OCG and it meets the uh, current uh, standards and regulations in British Columbia. Super, thank you. Um, and in terms of uh, electrical supply, uh, is it necessary that agricultural land be first choice for right-of-ways uh, in terms of uh, the requirement to supply energy to the compressor plant at the uh, new Tilbury facility? So I think there are probably a cu couple of questions there with respect to the existing uh, expansion. It is simply an upgrading of the current 69 kV line that goes into the facility. Uh, if that facility is expanded beyond the uh, current size, so are you talking about a phase 1B or a phase 2 expansion, it is likely additional supply will be required. And we're currently researching a number of different alternatives, uh, working with the Corporation to Delta Department of Highways uh, to find uh, uh, reasonable alternatives to how we might deliver uh, uh, electricity to that particular facility. And uh, as we work our way through that process, we'll, uh, we'll be engaging with the stakeholders. Um, is the proposed marine jetty contingent or linked to the George Massey Tunnel replacement project? In other words, the, uh, the uh, requirement of the, um, of the uh, bridge to be able to carry the, uh, or be sorry, to uh, requirement of the bridge to be high enough to allow for the toing and froing of, uh, of LNG barges and tankers from your facility. Our project has um, no concerns or uh, issues with whether the tunnel stays or the bridge goes in. Uh, we have, of course, inquired about the dimensions of the new bridge, and uh, our vessels would have no problem going under what's proposed. And uh, our ships are uh, only going to be uh, nine and a half to ten and a half meters draft. The river is currently uh, rated for 11 and a half meters, so uh, we're just fine with the depth. So, um, I'd like to see it from a traffic perspective. It's, uh, <laughs> it's a challenge. Go we'll back and forth over that a lot. But uh, uh, our project is totally indifferent to whether it's the tunnel stays or the bridge comes. Uh, Westpac has the export license. Uh, is it, uh, is in some cases, it's again what's expressed here is the export license for more LNG than Fortis BC can produce. How will Fortis BC meet Westpac's demand? Well, what we, we've estimated that we think there's more property there and it is possible for them to do for future expansions. Uh, we frankly have just recently reduced uh, our, that estimate and so we've correspondingly reduced the number of vessels. We originally had 212 uh, vessels per year. We've lowered that to 124, but it's based on our estimate of what we think they could possibly produce. So and it may not be accurate. And the National Energy Board approval is for the amount of LNG that you will be exporting relative to the total supply to ensure that Canada's reserves are still intact, correct? That's correct. Uh, the world is facing a glut of LNG supply for at least the next 10 years. Uh, why do we need another Tilbury? Or why do we need a Westpac? Well, I would just say that the, uh, for us, the market is the medium to small market. Uh, things like Asian islands, Hawaii, and uh, well, I've seen the, we've seen the news, of course, also. But uh, there's a number of niche markets. There's also the barge market for the ships. So while uh, globally the, some of the major consumers uh, may be uh, having some oversupply, uh, that's not really our market for, for uh, Tilbury. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, with time being such that it is, uh, I'd like to uh, draw our event to a close, but please join with me in thanking our guest presenters today.